was that obnoxious comment, well, I used to think the risks were largely on the downside, and I now think they're evenly balanced. This is like when the weather forecaster you know, says, there's zero chance of snow. You know, this is a this is pretty big deal. And, and this is a, a direction in which Dave and I and Joe Gagnon and others here at the Institute of Work on the US have been leaning for a while. But I think it does matter that a lot, that the, in particular that the housing market turn and also that the sustainability of Fed policy really are there. And, and that this, this is going to give an ongoing framework for growth. I think two things that Dave talked about six months ago that I just want that couldn't fit into the, into the uh, presentation today that I don't want us to lose sight of are Dave reminded us last time, and I think it bears reminding, we do have this variable that we don't know the full extent of the lasting labor market damage from the recession in the U.S. The, we are still at a very low level of participation rate versus the past. Yeah, we're a long way from filling the output gap, from filling the employment gap. So when we talk the two-year horizon, we got room to go. But when you're thinking about the medium term, you got to keep in mind that there may be some damage to U.S. labor markets that have not yet, would, even if Dave believes them, which he doesn't have to say today, are not necessarily built into this short-term forecast. Turning to Barbara, I think it, it gives a great example of the kind of political economy work we do here, which, of course, Jacob also does trying to tell you where some of these choice points are. And obviously, if you look at just a Cuba or even just a Venezuela, the direct global GDP impact is small. But if there's one thing that we have learned from being the home of the original Washington consensus, let alone watching what happens in Europe, as Jacob points out about consensus there, or those of us who've suffered through shifting central bank consensi through the years, is policymakers do tend to move in herds. They do tend to move in groups. And part of what made, I think, Barbara's spider chart of the 21st century socialists versus the 21st century uh, capitalists was very telling. And part of what's driven that is you have this Bolivar-esque figure with new energy in Chavez. And a world in which multiple regimes are moving at the same time, and then you have secondary regimes like Ecuador and Bolivia and Cuba who were basically living off of the post-Soviet money coming out of Venezuela instead, you could see much more of a wide shift. And I think one way to, to exaggerate responsibly Barbara's position is to say that in the next couple years, you could be seeing a significant turn in that spider chart, a real fattening of the left side. Or putting it differently, there's got to be a lot of trimming of socialist sales. Um, finally, turning to Jacob, Jacob, of course, as always, gives us an insight into the minds of the policymakers. And unfortunately, I have to completely agree with him on the ECB. Uh, the, the OMT, the promise that these, the, the ECB will intervene conditionally into bond markets, government bond markets, essentially boxes them in, because then it means they don't want to intervene unconditionally. They, they've sort of limited themselves. And so I think it is a very fair perspective, Jacob says. I think also you really do want to listen to him, as everyone here has known to listen to him and Fred and Anders and Nicholas Veron on the European politics, that things are more stable. But I just have to push back one little bit. The fact that things are politically supportable or sustainable does not mean that they're optimal or nice. And Jake, I'm not accusing Jacob of saying that, but we have to recognize that you could have ongoing 30, 40 percent youth unemployment in many of these countries doing lasting damage to their supply capacity, to their future prospects, and yet not change the current government regime. And if you think about it, you have a world where this is after World War II. We've got constitutions in place in Europe specifically to keep out radical parties and keep them marginalized. We do, with the exception of Greece, still have reasonably generous welfare states. We do have systems where the old people are going to be voting more than the young unemployed. So there's a logic why their dissatisfaction doesn't necessarily translate into political change. So I want to concur with Jacob. I think he's making the right call. But none of us should delude ourselves that just because it's politically sustainable, it's anything like a good outcome. So on that cheery note, let me open up for questions. I'll come up here and just direct traffic. Um, as, as usual, we have a traveling mic near the front. If you're near the back, you can go up to the standing mic to ask a question. Please identify yourself. 
Also, I'd like to ask that the first three or so questions at least come from our outside guests and not from the Institute. Thank you. <laughs> Who's first? Okay. Hi, Jessica Einhorn, uh, Peterson Board. Um, I'd like to ask a question about Japan, which is a major economy and which um, each of you can reflect on uh, in different ways. And of course, Adam may come back uh, back into it. Um, I find that the even the best of reporting on Japan now is about as absurd as anything I've I recall seeing. Um, you get article after article, FT and others, saying this is exquisitely difficult, it's almost impossible, but they must do it. Um, and then they wave off whatever the issues are about what's happening to fiscal policy. So I'd like to ask um, for some remarks about what the chances are of Japan really going off the rails in the period that you're talking about through 2015. Um, because uh, most of the experts simply seem to be saying um, this was absolutely essential even if it's impossible. Um, okay, my colleagues are looking at me. Um, I always look at the boss. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. So I'm getting all these people publicly acknowledging I'm the boss. It's very exciting. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'll just try to answer quickly on Japan so we can focus on this, although you're right, Jessica, that was another topic we could have chosen to cover today. It's very important. Japan is still the world's third largest economy, and if they grow at 2% instead of 1%, that's big, and if their bond market collapses, that's huge. So you're absolutely right to put that out there. In my opinion, and in full disclosure, I am in contact with the Prime Minister's office and the Cabinet office in Japan. I am a fan of Abenomics, as is probably clear. Um, I, I think they do have a difficult path to navigate, but the issue is less cosmic than somehow the reporters make it. And therefore, uh, it is a little more tractable. I understand what you're saying about the divide between the rhetoric and the reality. So let me just put it bluntly. As, as we had our Abenomics event here with Professor Hamada Koichi and Motos, Motoshige Ito, um, there are three pegs to Abenomics. One is the monetary peg, one is the structural reform peg, and one is the fiscal peg. The monetary peg, we can talk about another time. Full steam ahead, God love them, I think they're going to do it, and it, they are going to make a material difference to prices. So that's going to help. Structural reform, hope springs eternal. Arthur Alexander, among others, is in the audience, can comment on this. But the fact that, in part through efforts by Jeff Schott in this room, Barbara's work on TPP, me and some other folks, but mostly because they get it, the Abe government did sign up for TPP. And that is the best path to them doing structural reform of anything they've done. And for the Abe government to do that ahead of the upper house election says they do mean business. Now, of course, they're going to whine about rice and all that. We get it. But it is meaningful. So then there's the fiscal question. The trick is it would be enormously harmful to credibility to markets, to their fiscal outlook, even if they have growth if they do not raise the consumption tax in 2014 and 2015, the national VAT, as they've promised they will do. So much blood has been spilt for that, and it is the only way they get their fiscal path onto a sustainable path. So they have to do that. But they learned the lesson of 97, and they now admit that if they do raise the consumption tax by 5% of GDP, 5% in a year, it probably does slow the economy a little. And so the government forecasts now do admit, if you look at them, they, they'll talk about a 2 plus percent growth rate in 2013 and something going close to zero in 2014. And there are a number of people, mostly prominent people in Japan, but including people like me, or for that matter, Marty Feldstein, who have said, you know, you might want to smooth that a little. You might want to not cut off the recovery. So yes, do the permanent consumption tax rise, but try to think about you know, a temporary investment tax cut, a temporary rebate on income tax, just to smooth the path. And they have enough room to do that. I mean, I'm, I'm quite confident they have enough fiscal room to do that. The place where the drama happens is twofold. First, if they just, for political reasons, despite the prime minister and the new government's strength, still want to persist in the same old public work spending pandering that they've always done, instead of doing this temporary kind of tax cut, they may get zero bang for the buck and just miss the opportunity. The second is they've got this narrow window where I fear 
this is me doing politics, which I don't do as well, frankly, as Barbara does Latin America or Jacob does Europe. But I have a fear that if the Abe government and BOJ efforts combined don't lead to a multi-year recovery, then everybody says, okay, that really is it, game over. And whether literally on the numbers it's game over or not, that becomes self-fulfilling. So when you say what's going to happen to the Japanese bond market between now and 2015, I think short term, BOJ is going to make a material difference. Yield curve is going to flatten and lower. Things will get better. Nominal yields are going to, nominal yields are going to go up. Real yields are going to go down. The question is, do you get enough growth by 2015 to make that sustainable or not? Sorry? Yeah. Uh, gentleman at the back and then. Yeah. The gentleman at the back and then Mark at the front table. So. Hi, uh, I'm Paulo Sotero from the Wilson Center. I wanted to, I'm curious about your assessment of the domestic factors in the U.S. and in the European Union that may impact this proposed negotiation of a trade agreement between the two areas. Uh, how do you see it right now? Are you optimistic about the chances of that agreement and what would be its, its impact? overall in the economy of both regions. Um, just to be fair, full disclosure, Barbara can talk about that and Jacob can talk about that. I'm probably not going to put Dave on the line for that. I will point out that Jeff Schott has a policy brief about to come out, just came out, came just came out looking at this issue um, and which I commend to all of you and we'll be doing more events relating to that. But Barbara, do you want to say something about how you see the domestic politics going on on what is no longer TAFTA. <laughs> what is no longer TAFTA. And then Jacob. The TPTIP. Um, well, the domestic politics, I mean, at this point, look positive in terms of going for a, a TTIP. Obviously, there are sticky issues in the EU, in any EU US negotiation, as there are in the T Trans Pacific Partnership. Um, but rhetorically, there seems to be strong support on both sides, um, witnessed by the German bus that goes through Washington that has TTIP on it. So that's great. You know, consumer education for that, of course, on Europe will pass it to Jacob. Uh, no, I mean, I, very quickly, I think. Uh, so policy support for this is quite strong uh, everywhere in Europe, uh, especially in Germany. And that actually matters quite a bit, in my opinion, for domestic, quote unquote, European politics of this. Because, first of all, you know, Germany, nothing happens in Europe unless Germany wants it. But Germany really wants this, uh, which means that they'll be willing to pay for it. Uh, which means that uh, there's actually, in my opinion, quite a lot of opportunities for other Euro area countries uh, before we start the negotiations with, uh, uh, with the United States uh, to actually uh, put together some sensible uh, changes to Euro area political institutions. Uh, you know, we've already had a global globalization fund run by the European Commission. Uh, well, I think that you could, uh, you could uh, easily demand from Germany that that fund be resurrected, indeed expanded quite a bit, uh, and used for purposes similar to what we know as trade adjustment assistance here uh, in the United States. Uh, I don't think that that's something that, uh, I mean, that's a way to basically uh, tap into, uh, you know, German fiscal reserves, if you like, uh, uh, as part of this uh, deal. Uh, domestically in Europe. So no, it matters. Uh, uh, and I also don't think that, that uh, uh, indeed, the fact that you have a French socialist president who is less behooven to agricultural uh, interest than uh, his uh, center-right predecessors is probably also a good idea. Uh, and the overall, shall we say, uh, centrist shift of the uh, uh, the, 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 the Mediterranean uh, uh, center-left parties, I think, again, be begs well for, uh, for this from the European side. Yeah, just to emphasize that we've got some very good work on this and ongoing, and uh, we'll be doing more with it. We're hoping to have an event with Jeff and with some of the actual negotiators uh, in coming weeks. Uh, I believe you're next, Mark. Hi, uh, Mark Finley with BP. Uh, Adam, thanks to you and your colleagues for another great event. Um, my question is, what does this worldview mean for uh, exchange rates? And, and how does the ongoing discussion around uh, currency wars or efforts to stimulate domestic demand play into that? Ooh, how nice of you to ask that. Um, 
I'm, I'm actually going to let Dave take that. I will just make a programming note. Uh, I hope you, you were doing this consciously. We're going to have a potentially groundbreaking conference tomorrow from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. in this very room on currency manipulation, um, currency wars, trade retaliation, legal implications. This is done under the leadership of Joe Gagnon, um, who's been doing very interesting, important work on currency manipulation. Obviously, Fred Bergson's going to be putting in his oar on this as well. We have a, a distinguished legal panel, including Gary Huffbauer and our old friend Mike Gadbaugh, talking about legal retaliations linking to the WTO. And I'll be chairing a luncheon panel with the Deputy Governor of the Bank of Canada, the Deputy Governor of the Banco de Brazil, I'm sure I pronounced that wrong, and uh, Benoit Carré of the ECB, as well as our own Robert Zellick, talking about the tensions in the currency field. So this is the place to just come spend the day tomorrow as well as today. But leaving that aside, where do you see the currency wars playing in this forecast, Dave? So basically, I would expect uh, you know, the dollar maybe to firm somewhat over the first uh, half, three quarters of this year, but then move sideways in nominal terms, uh, given inflation differentials, probably some uh, decline in the real dollar over the course of the next three years. That's part of what's providing, as I indicated in 2014, 2015, a little bit of an upward uh, impetus from, external, uh, from the external sector. Some of that's pick up in activity, and some of that's a, a small decline in the real value of the dollar. But uh, um, I'm not really anticipating any sharp or marked movement in the overall broad real dollar at this point. Uh, no, I, I guess I, I don't disagree uh, with, with Dave at all. I guess just to, to the extent that if we believe that uh, you know, mar uh, foreign exchange markets really take all their cues from policymakers today and that they don't really care about economic fundamentals uh, uh, rather than they, they only care about what policymakers say. Well, if that, if that worldview is true, which I think is doubtful, uh, but in that, uh, in that sense, I would, I would expect the European Central Bank to be the least willing, as I said. Uh, they will keep sitting on the fence. They're not going to do major QE, despite the Japanese, the Bank of England, and the Fed continuing. Uh, and ironically, uh, uh, the it, it, their fear of, of because the fear of exit uh, problems for them is so high uh, is going to be prevent them from getting in uh, really in the first place uh, to some extent leaving aside the obvious I mean this is this is also not going to happen right in the midst of a German election campaign. Yeah. I, I guess just to, just to restate it slightly differently from my point of view, I think monetary decisions are not going to be primarily driven by exchange rates. Uh, even in Japan. Uh, they've already gotten the depreciation, they've locked it in, um, and the ECB, for the reasons Jacob said, is is not going to be sacrificing other goals for, for, for exchange rate goals. Obviously, some smaller countries may, and the question is whether the Switzerland's and the Hong Kong's and the Brazil's and the Turkey's and how that plays out, and that, again, is something we'll discuss tomorrow. I guess the thing is just to pick up on the exit point. There's going to be a premium on sort of reverse musical chairs. No one is going to want to be the first to tighten. Even though it probably means good news that your economy is recovering faster than everybody else, no one is going to want to be the first to tighten because that will probably have a big, at least short-term exchange rate impact. And that may come back to bite us in a minor way. Um, someone in the back now. Yes, Alan. Alan Wolf, McKenna Long and Aldridge. Question about China. Uh, my assumption is that uh, nothing dramatic in the, from your first slide in the next three years. But what's the trend? Uh, is there some internal balancing that's going to go on, greater domestic demand, uh, a move in the direction that the U.S. has been uh, proselytizing or uh, not? Well. It would appear I should have followed everyone else and pivoted this panel to Asia uh, instead of reminding people of non-Asia. Uh, you're standing next to Nick Lardy, who will give you a very canned summary quickly. I'll just give you my distilled version of the canned summary, which is, as Nick Borst and Nick Lardy have articulated in a proposal they've published through us, there is a path 
that the Chinese new regime can follow in its own self-interest to rebalance domestically. It is one that actually is reasonably consistent with their stated priorities. It involves some measure of financial liberalization and that it is doable in scale, and they cite a very interesting example of Taiwan making a similar shift in scale from having a huge investment share of GDP and moving into a more balanced economy. But I mean, Nick, that's fair. And so therefore, that's why, and just to feature how we do this, Dave really does touch base with all of our regional experts, in particular Nick, obviously. And um, when we put in that bullet point about 8.5, 8 to 8.5, that's because that would be Nick's assessment of on average where the trend's going to be in the next few years. Yeah, Richard. Rich Sokolow, Elliott Management. Barbara, can you talk a little bit more about Brazil? And Brazil seems to be like the important swing country between the uh, 21st century socialists and capitalists. And also, where do you think Brazil is going? Give you a sense of your forecast for them. And also the impact on what happens with Brazil on the other countries on both sides of that fence. Right, thank you. Um, and I think that's an appropriate characterization. Brazil is sort of a swing state between the, the 21st socialist and 21st century capitalists. I mean, Brazil is much more pragmatic, but has emphasized um, some of the aspects that the 21st century socialists have um, <clears throat> of social spending, somewhat more protectionist, less protectionist than Argentina, which I think, in terms of trade protection, is currently the winner in. Latin America, and I think the eighth, you know, top protector in the world. Um, you know, Brazil obviously has slowed down in terms of its growth, and whether you think that that's structural or a hangover from the boom times in in the mid 2000s, as the government has said, you know, there are obviously things that Brazil needs to do now. The press has picked up on this. You know, Brazil being no longer the country of yesterday, but now, or the country of tomorrow, but the country of today, and now is Brazil again the country of yesterday? I think that's unfair um, in the comparisons with Mexico. Where I do think that there's a fair comparison with Mexico is that Brazil has some of the same microeconomic challenges that Mexico is currently addressing. And so perhaps some of Mexico's difficult but important um, reforms will help with, you know, Brazil undertake some similar, you know, politically challenging reforms. Obviously, education is is a challenge. Um, another challenge is infrastructure, and a real problem in in Brazil is still the the, um, the Brazilian cost, where even kind of companies that have invested while Brazil has been growing and Brazil has a wonderful, you know internal market um, of course there's you know the fight is Brazil now the sixth largest or the seventh largest economy I think that's that's immaterial um, but there is a large cost to doing business in Brazil this brings down Brazil in terms of its competitiveness and obviously that's not an easy fix it's not a matter of you know tweaking a macro variable but a lot of hard work on a lot of different planes um, but I'd say that this is the time for Brazil to really take a look at that um, take a look at its position vis-a-vis -vis openness Brazil's not a very yeah. open economy and when you look at what the countries that are growing in the 21st century capitalist um, basket are doing. They're looking out to Asia. They're trying to harmonize their, their trade agreements. They're trying to eliminate some of the, the barriers or the, the costs um, that are keeping them from participating fully in global supply chains. Brazil is focusing much more on South America. It's focusing on Mercosur. Um, that's probably keeping Brazil back. Um, we, again, because there's such a rich world out there, and Barbara, of course, as you just saw, really covers Brazil, we chose to emphasize the more swing stories, not in the sense you meant it, Rich, we completely agree Brazil's the swing state, but in the sense the one's more likely to see a big change in the short term. But just, if I could ask you, Barbara, to draw you out just one step further, mm -hmm. because that, in line with what you were saying at just a minute ago, characterizing Brazil on openness, if I recall your spider chart correctly, the little green line said that where they were almost most I don't want to say backwards, let's say most anti-market, was in terms of international investment policy. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that, but the, 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 the investment freedom, I think, was where they were, they were doing poorly. 
So could you just say a little more about in the current political situation in Brazil, the post-Lula world, what's sort of the ideological content? Are they pragmatic on that? Is BNDES going to do something weird? How do you see the investment issues in Brazil? Well, I think the goods market efficiency was, was a little lower than the investment freedom. Um, and But that also impacts investment. I mean, we've talked to companies who want to increase their investment in Brazil and seem to be in line with Brazil's policy of trying to promote higher tech, higher value added development, right, which, which makes sense. But then they impose these hundred tariffs that make it very difficult for these companies to import necessary intermediate inputs, boost, br brings up the cost for them of production, brings up the cost of investing, and increases the cost to consumers, which inflation in Brazil is pretty much hitting the upper bound of their target, which is about 6.5%, which also, it was so I, I, I think investments, um, yes, in terms of the limits on you know some of the, the, the you know, capital, um, taxes, um, I'd say that probably taxation, if I, I mm -hmm. should have included something on efficient tax mechanisms, of course, you know, the, yeah. that, that, that gets kind of complicated. Um, but I think that in terms of their goods market efficiency, or good goods market controls, that's probably just as important. Thank you for clarifying that priority. Uh, anyone else? Taking internal questioners. Angel Bide now counts as internal. Yeah, you do. Go to the back. No. <laughs> go to the back. Do not pass go. Do not pass go, right. Do not pass go. Do not collect 200 pesetas. Go. Okay. So this is a question for Dave. Dave, you said that the threshold will be a trigger for the Fed. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Does that mean that... Uh, they are not telling us the whole truth now, or do you think that by the time we get there, they will become scared, or there will be political pressure, or it will become, what, why do you think that these two things will get together? So I should qualify my, my, um, my assertion. So I'm thinking that it's going to be closer to a trigger than a threshold, because the unemployment rate is going to be on a steady downtrend at the point they hit six and a half. And therefore, they're going to be looking ahead. One, they're going to be uncertain about what level of unemployment, in fact, is the natural rate or full employment. Two, they'll be hitting that point with growth above potential and a downtrend in the unemployment rate. And looking ahead, I'm thinking that when they actually get to six and a half, they'll use that opportunity pretty quickly to at least do the initial increase in, in the funds rate. Now, if that's wrong and we're, we're approaching six and a half on a much shallower trajectory, I could actually see that then being more of a threshold than a trigger and then being the Fed deciding to be a, a little bit more uh, relaxed about the unemployment rate, wanting to make sure that, in fact, the improvement that they've seen is going to be sustainable. I don't think they're uh, deliberately attempting to mislead us. So this is really more uh, a, uh, uh, a forecast about how they'll approach 6.5% uh, unemployment than a matter of uh, uh, Fed communications being uh, sort of attempting to talk down uh, interest rates when they don't really mean it. In fact, I think they've been pretty, uh, they've, they've been reasonably clear about that. Uh, so that's sort of my view on that particular issue. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Angel. Anyone else? Have we beat you into submission with our mastery of the entire world? No, I see a gentleman there who's trapped. Give him the microphone. Uh, hello, my name is Jose Polito. I work for Mitsui USA. I wanted to ask, um, there's a lot of talk between the U.S. and the European Union about uh, expanding trade relationship, but how will that affect the 21st century socialist countries, uh, particularly Barbara, do you think that they're going to open up um, now that the two most powerful economic forces might uh, expand their trade? Um, that's an interesting question. I think um, whether the TTIP could cause pressure on the on the 21st century socialist exchange, I, I, I would say in the short term, that probably wouldn't be the force that I would be looking at um, for, for changes in economic policy. Um, most of these countries are 
have strong relationships with both the U.S. and the EU, um, but aren't actively engaged in trade negotiations and don't have sort of preferential trade negotiations or trade agreements with either of those countries. And so unless you see a lot of trade diversion as a result of the TTIP, which given the commodity export status of most of these countries is unlikely, um, I don't think that would be a real pressure point. But it's an interesting thing to, to think about. Um, they don't seem to have been swayed by other trade agreements going on, um, the TPP, for example, or other countries entering into free trade agreements with the United States, um, you know, in some cases, in the case of Venezuela, that has caused them to take sort of more inward actions, abandoning the Andean community, for example, which included Colombia and Peru, which did sign a free trade agreement with the United States, and becoming a full member of Mercosur, which I think has caused some complications for Mercosur, which is in negotiations with the EU, but has been since the early 2000s without really a lot of movement there. Now, if the TTIP causes the EU-Mercosur negotiations to accelerate and something to actually happen there, now that would be exciting. Yeah, that, that would be our competitive liberalization in action. Um, Ted Truman. So one comment and a question and a half. Uh, the comment is, uh, I mean, you all touched on, you, Adam, sort of indirectly about sort of the first move in monetary policy whenever it comes in general in the world. May well, I agree, they're not likely to see it right away. Uh, I'm not sure that history actually completely bears you out, Adam, that uh, that will produce a big surge in the economy, in the exchange rate of that country the lesson of, 2000, of 1994, which is what everybody's talking about in the bond market debacle, was actually the reverse. The dollar went down in that period. It was a, uh, substantially. Uh, uh, it had something to do with the beginning of the Clinton administration and, and trade wars with the uh, putative trade wars with Japan, but it was a, a classic example where exchange rates didn't follow, uh, didn't follow interest rates. But I think that comes to the, seems the question we, I mean, this is not a criticism. I, so what is, how do we put it all together? Uh, so the United States is doing a bit better, Dave tells us. Uh, Europe is going to be where it has been for the next 18 months anyhow. Uh, uh, Latin America is going to be somewhat mixed, so not much, much better. Uh, so, and uh, developing countries as, as uh, other emerging market developing countries, Dave said, will be a mixed bag. So we're looking for maybe a little more growth this year than last year in the world as a whole, but, uh, but decidedly subpar. I mean, that's a question of, of, uh, of uh, I guess I'm looking for some confirmation because uh, in terms of uh, takeaway, and that does have some, uh, this is the half question, that does have some implications for, if you want to put it the other side of the currency war question, Right, whether there will, how many countries will go the route of active, active uh, uh, depreciation of the currencies and try to get it out? I personally think it's pretty difficult for any of the major currency, any major countries, including now Japan, to actively, meaning sell, uh, sell the domestic currency in the foreign exchange market to do so. Uh, and I don't see it in the UK, and I don't see certainly the ECB in the United States doing it, notwithstanding what Fred would like them to do. Uh, uh, but I'd be interested in your any comments on that, Mark. Yeah. Dave, do you want to do the summing up, both literal and figurative? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I guess a um, couple, couple points. Um, I guess I've drunk the Kool-Aid. I, I think the central bank story, that the central banks, major central bank stories, that they're pursuing their domestic objectives with very expansionary monetary policy, is in fact what is proceeding, and it is not principally uh, organized around an effort to uh, have a competitive uh, devaluation. And one, I, I, don't, I think they must recognize that that's not necessarily even possible. But as you point out, the global economy, certainly the major advanced economies, are all so weak that I think this uh, application of 
of expansionary policy. Maybe not so much the ECB, as, as Jacob noted, a uh, little less hesitance there, but certainly in the United States. I think we're going to see more in the United Kingdom. Uh, we're obviously going to, uh, we're already seeing uh, Bank of Japan, more active discussions. And that this is both, um, it's necessary in the, in the current setting. You know, to some extent, central banks have been placed in a position that obviously they're uncomfortable with, uh, they didn't ask for, but they've got it. And that is, despite the fact that major central banks have lost some credibility over the last five or six years in the wake of the financial crisis, they're still the most credible policy game in town in almost all of these countries, certainly relative to the fiscal authorities. And um, it would be great if we could have a different mix of policies across the, the, the economies that put off fiscal consolidation some that allowed, uh, took some of the pressure off the extreme measures central banks have been forced into. Um, but I don't see that coming anytime soon. I have a little bit of, so I have a slightly different view than Adam does at least on, on this issue of um, fear about being the first to tighten when the time comes. Actually, I, I doubt that the Fed is going to be too deterred by a fear, especially of a, of a currency appreciation. They'll take that into account. Uh, they're gonna be more fearful about, um, th there's gonna be bumps in the road when the tightening when the tightening begins, and there are going to be vulnerabilities that uh, the Fed doesn't see that crop up, uh, and it will not be a smooth process. But I, in fact, think uh, when the time comes, they'll be looking at domestic circumstances, and they'll take, take the plunge. Uh, they might do so slowly to sort of test the waters. One difference between 1994 and the, what we'll experience sometime in 2014, 15, or 16 uh, is, gee, Fed didn't tell the markets or the public anything about its policy intentions back then. We just did it. Now I think there will be an attempt to, uh, with a more active communication policy, prepare the markets for the time when the time comes. That will not ameliorate all of the uh, uh, financial uh, um, uh, vulnerabilities, but it will certainly, uh, it will certainly help. Thank you so much. Uh, letting Dave have the last word on Federal Reserve, I think, is entirely appropriate. Um, thank you all for joining us. I hope many of you will join us either tomorrow or by webcasting, uh, either live or, in, live or by webcasting for tomorrow's currency conference. I hope you all mark your calendars for roughly six months when Dave and another pair of erstwhile senior fellows will give you the global economic prospects from the Peterson Institute and we'll see you many times in between. This meeting's adjourned.